and you probably would have felt the same way. <laughs> um, it's needless to say, it's been a strange and challenging year. Um, it's been a tragic year as well with um, hundreds of thousands of Americans falling victim to COVID-19 and probably 10 times more suffering um, as a result of it. Um, as you all know, the, um, the patients that we serve in the safety net, uh, which is now numbering north of um, about 40,000 Marin, um, Marinites, um, has been disproportionately affected. And that's mostly as a result of you know, this interesting new dichotomy that was developed around some workers being essential and some workers being non-essential. But really, it, it's not, a, I think it's, frankly, I think that's the wrong phrasing. I think it was more about which workers had the privilege to work remotely via Zoom um, and work from home and which workers did not have the privilege of doing so and could not perform their job duties um, remotely. And, you know, it makes sense. Some professions you just can't do remotely and by telehealth and so forth. So, you know, our, the, the folks that have been out and about and serving the rest of us um, in grocery stores and in other industries, construction and caregiving and so forth, have, you know, borne the brunt of this so far. The interesting thing, and I've kind of been raising the flag about this for some time, that when some in our community are affected, none of us are immune. And this third wave is bearing that out. And um, it seems like this third wave of the, of the virus is hitting more broadly and the broader swath of the population. But um, the good news, as you all know, is that there seems to be one, two, maybe up to six vaccines in the offing. So hopefully we can begin to bend the curve as they will and actually squash it once and for all with help of a vaccine. But, um, you know, it, it, it portends to be a challenge for the next at least a year to come. Um, for Marin Community Clinics, it's been a roller coaster. I won't lie to you. Um, we've, we've had, um, you know, early on in the pandemic in March, we had to drastically shift our entire operation. We had to close our dental clinics um, and consistent with the recommendations that were put out by national and state bodies to try to slow the spread of COVID-19. Uh, we had to rapidly convert the rest of our services to telehealth. So literally in a weekend, um, and some of the um, MCC clinical staff will maybe not so fondly remember that challenge of in about a weekend, we literally flipped the switch. And what we would normally have done probably in about a multi-year planning process happened in a weekend. We had to convert everything to telehealth. And we now have a phone first model to try to keep people safe. Um, we were very aggressive early on in adopting universal masking, even prior to, way prior to the CDC guidance. We won't even have that conversation. But well, you know, we were definitely on the early adopter side of that, following some of the best practices that were emerging in the early science and the early data that was coming out. Uh, and we've adopted procedures such as at the front door screening, which are now routine. Everyone's doing it, but we were at the front edge of that. So I'm proud of our our staff, I'm proud of um, our, our team for being at the cutting edge and at the front edge of trying to keep our patients and our staff safe. I'm also happy to report that while we've had a number of our staff affected, which presents a challenge to our ongoing operations, the, the amount of transmission, we cannot for sure say that there has been transmission between staff to staff or, or patient to staff at, at the clinic. Um, most of what we've seen has been at home. Um, and people's home environments and how people are um, engaging socially and connecting socially and so forth. So I think that's, you know, the, you know, been our message to our staff and to our, uh, our patients is to really be cautious and careful at home. And I encourage all of you while we're in this hopefully fourth quarter of the pandemic, it's premature to say that, but as we're all getting impatient, 
please be safe and please take care and, you know, be cautious of who you let indoors without a mask um, to be with you. So please be cautious and careful. Um, don't let your guard down. Um, dispel the myths. Help the good ambassadors of, of uh, good behavior within your bubbles, within your families. I know I, I battle this with my own and I've shared with some of you all with my own family and cousins and parents and so forth, the, all these interesting things that people come up with and have to explain to them, no, masks do not deprive you of oxygen. No, uh, you're, you're not going to be having <laughs> long-term consequences and sequelae. And no, you, you're, you're not a, it's not just transmitted in the healthcare setting. And actually, yes, you're actually more at risk by you know interacting with your friends and family who may be pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic, that sort of thing. So anyway, so uh, I will, that's sort of the, the overall snapshot of kind of the year. And I'll, I'll chime in more at the end after we have the, uh, our panel of experts and our, and the wonderful Dr. Um, Tom Peters uh, provide some, some, some words for us. Um, about and I'll share sort of our vision going forward and our plans for the for the coming years. Um, and I just really want to you know thank all of you for joining us today for continuing to support Marin Community Clinics and the work we do, uh, the patients we serve. Uh, your support um, is critical now more than ever uh, for the reasons that I outlined um, under challenging circumstances. Um, uh, I, I likened what we went through in the spring as a plane going through turbulence, and then the summer kind of felt like this little calm pocket. But the air, and then you could hear the pilot getting on the on the in, on the intercom saying, "Buckle up, more turbulence ahead." And here we are; we're in more turbulence ahead, and probably the worst turbulence that we've seen in, a, in generations from a public health standpoint. So hopefully, we all get through this phase and and get through the, to the other side safely. Um, so I, I, we have a delight for you today. Uh, we have a panel of experts. We have um, Dr. Melanie Thompson, who's been leading much of our COVID-19 response in, and has is is done a wonderful job doing so. Um, leading, she, has, she is steeped in a lot of the tactical things that we've done and all the testing that we've done. And, and now as we're pivoting towards vaccine uh, delivery and administration, uh, next, we'll have Dr. Peter Simon, who is one of our lead pediatricians and, and also an, in, an expert in informatics, um, and he'll provide an interesting perspective on our care towards for children and, and I'm sure weave in some of the uh, interesting challenges with telehealth and, ben and opportunities there. Uh, and next, we'll have Dr. Connie Cadera, who is our chief dental officer, uh, and uh, Connie will be able to talk to us about, I'm sure, our challenges with the dental program, all the modifications that we've made to make dentistry, the practice of dentistry as safe as we can, um, and what, what things look like going forward. And we'll, we'll end with Dr. Karen Schmidt, who is our Associate uh, Director of Behavioral Health and also uh, specialized in, in pediatric care and can talk about um, that important topic of behavioral health care. And, Probably, I'm sure she'll have things to say about the opportunities with telehealth that we've seen realized through the through the pandemic, um, and it's been a it's been a real benefit to our patients. So, without further ado, we'll start with uh, Dr. Thompson. Um, could you share with us a bit um, how things have been going? What are the, you know, what are things? How are things going from your perspective? I'll give you a really open ended, and then we'll we'll go from there. <laughs> Thanks, Mitesh, and thanks um, everyone for being here. It's, it's really wonderful to see so many faces. Um, I, you know, I was reflecting on this breakfast coming up and just sort of my experience over the last nine months and thinking, usually when people ask me um, what prepared me for, for a job in medicine, I usually respond back that my job at Denny's is what, what prepared me for my job in medicine. And, and I say that because um, I worked in a lot of different areas, uh, and my favorite was the kitchen. And, and part of that was if you were in the kitchen and you saw the line go out the door, you know, we just had some language pieces, and one of them was cakes all day. And cakes all day meant you turned and you just fired the grill up with as many pancakes as you could so that you could push out breakfast. 
Uh, and that's sort of how I think about our experience in this, in this pandemic, um, that it's just been cakes all day uh, from that first weekend. So, you know, Matesh talked about, we made this ginormous uh, operational change. I mean, we really did do it over a weekend. It started with, you know, a text message of, do you have a minute? <laughs> uh, which led to several phone calls and then, um, you know, calling our clinic operations directors over the weekend, kind of drafting a plan that we were going to send out to everyone, sending the plan uh, in the morning and then changing all of our visits to, to telephone visits uh, in a day. Uh, and it, it's really remarkable to think that we have five clinical sites and that we were able to do that, uh, certainly with some bumps in the road, uh, but, but overall, I think we have been successful with that and, and in communicating to the to our staff overall. The, you know, the second thing for, for me was how do we convey all of this information and make sure that all the people who need to know about it, because you know, you're often siloed in clinic and you just think, I just need to tell my medical team about this and then we'll figure it all out. And what we found is actually everybody needed to know. Um, and so I sort of took the lead in sending out uh, clinical updates, which started just with our medical team and then brought into our dental team and then brought into human resources and our call center um, and our HIMSS department. Uh, and for me, that's actually been really wonderful to connect with people that I wouldn't normally have connected with, but also have them send responses back um, with appreciation for that connection. And I think that was a way really of integrating so many parts of our work um, and how important the, the team aspect of all the work that we do um, at all levels um, has been uh, something that I feel really, really grateful for and, and an ability to share even patient stories um, and safety information. So I definitely had lots of people um, respond back, you know, thank you so much for giving information about the importance of it being okay to be outside and exercising. I was able to convey that with my family members uh, and, and have people go outside. Um, we also knew early on that we were going to have lots of questions from our community. And so we set up respiratory clinics uh, in two different sites to take care of the entire organization. Um, and that was also a learning experience. So how do we assess respiratory symptoms over the phone and, and make sure that we don't need to bring that person in and then how do we bring people in safely when we know that they need to come in and how do we reassure our staff that we're doing that in a way that's also going to keep um, them safe um, and all the operational pieces of you know PPE which was you know short I mean we were not planning for a pandemic we certainly you know treat tuberculosis uh, and latent tuberculosis in one of our clinics but you know we we had masks for that. Now, how do we calculate and project how many masks we need for our entire organization um, and bringing um, patients in? And then the, you know, the other large part that we saw is in our particular community, you know, being disproportionately affected, we knew there was going to be a need for testing. Um, and so how do we integrate testing into our clinics and have personal protective equipment um, that would allow us to do that? We you know, partnered early on with Canal Alliance, which is one of our community partners. They were doing um, some testing and then we realized that we were going to need to bring that testing uh, over to our clinics um, so that we could you know, maintain that clinical assessments and, and set up for a trusted space for our patients. What you know, we, we heard from our patients um, and, and what we have continued to hear is that they really appreciate that we have set up drop-in testing and we're seeing a fair amount of patients. And, I think I calculated last week uh, that in, in the last nine months, we've done over 5,000 visits just related to COVID alone. And that, you know, that includes testing, but that also includes all of our telephone visits and in-person visits. Um, and you know, the other part that I am really proud of is we saw patients with COVID in our clinics at a time where you know, people were very afraid and not wanting to bring people in into clinics, but we have a population that is affected and we take care of pregnant women and babies and our pregnant population was affected and we still needed to bring them into clinic and see them and take care of them and take care of um, their children. And so that, that has been a lot of education for our staff and for the community that you know we, we are here. So we're tired. Um, my, my clinicians are tired. I'm, I'm tired, uh, but I think it's also just a, a good reminder of how important we are to this community and, um, and how much I value that. And, and certainly our last challenge is just then continuing to find ways to stay connected with one another. 
Um, so, you know, we, we are clinics that had potlucks every Friday and celebrated uh, every birthday, you know, if, if we could come up with something to celebrate, we were doing it. Um, and so, you know, as a part of keeping our staff safe, we had to close our, our staff rooms. And I would say that has been the biggest challenge uh, for us. You know, this is a, we work hard and we really like to be connected to one another. So not being able to give each other a hug or celebrate successes in the way that we, we would have normally has been um, challenging, but we certainly have gone out in the, you know, the courtyard and jump rope together and made videos together, socially distanced. Uh, and, and so I, I'm really proud of my staff. I would say that to me is the, my biggest take home over the last nine and 10 months is um, watching the staff here pivot and pivot and pivot um, and want to give back to this community. And, you know, whereas before we would have said like, how could we do that and how long will it take? Now I have a staff that just says we can do it. So thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you for your leadership. Um, it hasn't been easy. I, I didn't mention that Melanie is the medical director over, over our Santa Fe clinics. She's the regional medical director there. Um, and thank you so much. Let's let's pivot over to you know uh, to Dr. Peter Simon, and we will have hopefully have a few minutes to take questions. So if anyone has questions, feel free to put them into the chat, um, and we'll take them at the end of the panel. Um, uh, Dr. Simon. Dr. Simon, good morning. Hello, good, good morning. You, uh, I'm, my name is Peter. Can you share a bit about, yeah. No, over to you, go for it. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm a pediatrician at the San Rafael location. I'm also the IT clinician um, working throughout the organization to help with all the IT initiatives. Um, it's nice to see all the familiar faces. So hello to everyone that works with me and to all the new faces, um, it's an honor to talk to you. Thank you for um, all the help that you provide. Um, I think just to, to give some numbers to what's been discussed. In February, Marin Community Clinics had zero visits over the phone. 100% of all of our visits were done in person. That was in February. As of October, we had 10,000 telehealth visits in that month. That's 56% of all of our visits. So over half of all of the care that we're providing now, um, we're doing remotely. Um, and that's just to kind of give a sense of the, the drastic change where we moved from an organization that was doing everything in person to now half of our services are done remotely. Um, I can remember the days that you described, Mitesh, kind of those first few days when no one really knew what was happening and how serious this virus was and driving to work was kind of driving like in a, a post-apocalyptic world. It was me and five other cars in the morning. So that was re those were really incredible times. And I think, Melanie, you, you kind of really described kind of like three days turn everything around. Um, and I think to echo what everyone said, the truth is, um, those initial days where everything was kind of clamping down, it kind of, we realized, you know, we, we are a healthcare organization. Uh, we, we don't have the privilege of really closing down. People need to access healthcare. So I think through the months that have kind of passed, um, the fine balance has been deciding who, who do we bring into our clinics, who needs to come to our clinic, and how do we do that in a way that keeps um, patients safe and staff safe. And I think, you know, I, I, it's incredible, as everyone has said, um, how how diligent and how hard everyone has worked to kind of continue to modify that. Um, and, you know, we've, we've now moved to this phone first model where we take most calls or most complaints over the phone first to a telehealth visit and kind of decide, decide who needs to come in. Um, and I, Melanie, Dr. Thompson referred to these respiratory clinics. We've made sure that we have specific areas in our clinics designated for patients we think are high risk COVID um, to protect other patients and staff. Um, they, um, staff in those areas are used to dealing with these situations, they're more comfortable with PPE. So people who come in for testing are routed in those areas. So we've kind of, as, as we've moved to bring more and more people into the clinics, we've all been always diligent to make sure those people, um, the, peop uh, the staff working in those areas are also working hard to keep patients safe and keep other staff members safe. Once um, patients are in the clinic, I think as we, as our knowledge of the virus evolved, we've also adopted our practices. Initially, there was a lot of concern that the virus would um, remain on surfaces. So we were very, very aggressive about wiping and making sure everything got wiped and scrubbed and changed instruments. And that continues, but over time we've realized that airborne transmission is important and the time of the clinic is really key. So we've really now made an em emphasis on limiting the time that patients have to be in the clinic, kind of streamlining our workflow. So patients are in, in and out quickly. There are fewer people in the waiting room, fewer people in the hallways. Um, so these are all the operational things that we've done to kind of make sure we keep staff and patients safe, realizing that we need to see patients. Um, now on the technical side, as you imagine, it's no small feat to move to half our visits being done remotely. Um, 
obviously one of the things, the biggest things you expect and we found was that we ran into some um, bandwidth problems. So some difficulties with our, with our hardware and the computers that we had in, we did a recent upgrade where we upgraded a lot of our systems and that really helped as we moved to more use of the phones, the videos. Um, we obtained a new video platform so we can form some of our visits over, over video. And we're currently in the process of looking at a different and newer platform that will help that work even more smoothly, help us text message our patients directly. So, um, you know, the virus is not going to wean. Although we see a light at the end of the tunnel, the virus is here for a while and telehealth will probably be here to stay. So it's really important for us to kind of like, kind of plant our feet firmly and move forward so we get better at providing remote care. Um, initially, and as we move to more and more of our services being done remotely, we worked on uh, securing, making sure that our pharmacy has blood pressure cuffs, and then kind of coordinating with operations teams to get those blood pressure cuffs to patients at home, uh, um, oximeters so patients can measure their oxygen levels at home, glucometers so patients can measure their blood sugars at home, and then we could kind of help monitor these results over the telehealth visits. Um, now in the clinic, um, as you imagine, we've also mo modified, um, so for the people who stay in the clinic, we've changed many of our old clinic rooms to small offices. And that involves getting webcams that are installed and new phones um, as we kind of move to more a, a greater percentage of our visits being done over the phone. Now, in pediat pediatrics presents like a, it presented a special problem early on. And I think it was a good model for how we move to this use of phone and in-person visits. We, we found overall that many, many health concerns can be addressed um, over the phone, but um, a large part of pediatrics is well childcare or well visits. And these are healthy children that come in for their routine visits. So we can track their height, their weight, their development, um, address any concerns that patients have and give them vaccinations. And we, this is a very, very special population that we, would, we knew that if we brought these patients in, we would bring in patients who are healthy. We'd bring healthy children into our clinic and put them at risk for COVID. Um, on the one hand, we knew that if we didn't, we'd fall behind on vaccinations. And people have seen that across the country um, where kids haven't been done, vaccination rates have dropped. So it was very, very important for us to come up with a way of providing safe, um, well visit care. And um, you know, one of one of the one of the changes that we made is we divided our well child or well visits into two part visits. So um, pediatricians will now con connect with parents and do part of the visit over the phone, where we kind of discuss all the routine concerns that those parents may have, and then a second visit, which is very streamlined and very fast, where the parents will come in so that their child can get weighed, measured and we could uh, give them the vaccination they need. And you know, I'm proud to say, as we kind of review our pediatric care, we've done a, a great job comparatively at keeping our children vaccinated and keeping them on track with their routine vaccinations. Um, now, I think in addition to kind of those things that we made change in terms of operations and um, on the technical side, I think two things that really, that I feel very fortunate that we've had in place even before this pandemic started that I rely on a lot as a pediatrician um, is our care navigation program and our behavioral health program. And I think you'll hear more from that later when you hear about our behavioral health program. Um, but just to be clear, our care navigation program was a kind of a, a team throughout our organization that helped address the social concerns of our patients. Um, our population is highly vulnerable. And um, during this time of COVID, as you can imagine, um, the, there's an increase, a huge increase in stress, um, job insecurity, food insecurity. So it was really wonderful to have that team already in place. And early on, it, it was really easy. And I saw how, you know, as I talked to moms or, or dads and I realized that they were out of work or they were struggling to find food, I had someone I could quickly rely on to kind of send resources or contact the, the family to plug them in. And the same goes for um, stress or behavioral health or mental health concerns. Already our population was highly, highly um, distressed. Um, you can imagine a, a situation like this with increased pressure, and I see it. I see it. Um, a large percentage of my visits now are a much greater percentage deal with stress-related concerns, and it's wonderful to have um, a care navigation team and a behavioral health team that was already already robust, where I can easily plug these families in to get them the help I need. So I'm really, I think I'm really quite impressed and marvel that um how we've um, adapted. I think in terms of difficulties, I think obviously the, the technical difficulties will you know continue to to They'll, they'll continue to be present and we'll continue to address them as we go, as we modify, you know, adopt, adopt new technologies, train providers to use them. I think a difficulty for a population has been, a large percentage of the population has low literacy and that has affected our ability to engage with them around some of the use of technology. So when we've made modifications, 
where we might not be able to send a family a link where they can go online and complete a questionnaire uh, on a web page. We've had our medical students call them and complete the questionnaire with them over the phone. Um, so those are the ways that we serve our population. Um, now the flip side of, of those kind of modifications that we have to make is that it's, um, it's been difficult to keep up with our, our staffing needs. And I think that's something we'll continue to, 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 to look forward to and address, which is, uh, as, you, as I described these well visits, now every, whereas before we took only one visit to see a child, and now it takes two visits. Uh, so that means that um, you know, we, we need more staff. And, and you know, as a, as a clinic that um, did a, like a, a wonderful job of taking care of an underserved population, there was always a need for more providers, more staff, more clinicians. And now in this time of COVID, as we um, kind of modify our systems and use more people to reach out to patients, we're gonna to continue to need more and more staff. So I think we'll always continue to kind of work on infrastructure, staff. Um, I think, and maybe I, my, my final um, final word before I kind of um, pass on, I wanna echo exactly what Mitesh said. And in fact, with his opening, when he talked about um, how highly vulnerable our population is. Um, every morning on my drive to work, um, kind of my last term before I turn to the clinic, there, there, there's a parking lot. Um, and um, every morning I see, you know, maybe 515 kind of working age men standing there. And that's, um, that's a stand where, that, that's a stop where people stand there waiting to see if they will be picked up for a job. Those are day laborers. And, um, you know, I really love my job and um, I love what I do for this clinic. But sometimes, sometimes, you know, it could be a grind. I mean, job is a job. You work, you wake up early, you stay up late. But every morning as I drive by that parking lot, I remind myself what a privilege it is to have a regular job. These are people who are worried. They're struggling to provide for the family, to pay rent, to buy clothes for their children. And that day, they don't know if they will get hired. And I said, you know, as hard it is to have a job, it's great to have a regular job. And that was always something that I kept in the back of my mind. And during COVID, it's interesting because it's made the experience of driving through by the parking lot different. When the pandemic first started, that lot was empty. I saw no one there. And I realized, you know what? These are people who are staying home and now they don't have a job. And as Mitesh um, pointed out, you know, it, it, it really highlights the, the privilege of the people who have the, the ability to work remotely, work safely. Um, and now as, as we've as all well gotten used to the pandemic, the, the people are standing there again. And that's great, you know, maybe now they're, they're, getting, they're, they're getting work, but um, that doesn't mean it's safer. And the numbers um, and the newspaper headline says it's not safer. So what that means is that those patients are now um, exposing themselves. And that's why we see such a huge burden of, population, uh, of disease on the population. So I think um, it's always a reminder to um, how important and what a privilege it is to take care of this population. That's all. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for all that you do and the heart that you put into your work that comes through loud and clear, um, I'm sure to all of us. Um, let's segue to dentistry. Dr. Kadera, could you tell us about dentistry at MCC? The Hi, good you know, morning. The cha early, early challenges and where we're going? Sure, thank you, Matej. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending uh, this briefing. I'm very happy to be here today to share with all of you what dentistry has been about uh, since we uh, started the COVID pandemic. As uh, Matej was saying at the beginning, uh, dentistry really took a hard hit back in March. We got an email uh, on March the 15th at 11 o'clock from the American Dental Association stating that they were recommending to close the practices and practically just leave emergencies. So the following day, we had to really change everything. So we took such a turn, uh, drastic. We have three clinics and we cancel all the appointments except for the emergencies. And we didn't know where we're going. Um, as you know, when we do dentistry, we produce aerosols. That's the, the part that uh, was dangerous because it's transmitted via aerosols. Um, so we had to really take a, like a really deep breath and said, okay, what are we gonna, gonna do about this? We left with one clinic only. Everybody had to be for low, about maybe 95% of our dental staff had to be for low. So imagine that hit for all these people that were working for all these days and now they were out. 
we were dealing with uh, emergencies and um, we created the teledentistry at the same time because we didn't know who was gonna be infected. That was a huge undertaking, just to say the least. We have never offered services via teledentistry. We always have to see the patients in person, but uh, dealing with emergencies, pain, uh, we were able to, to capture some of those patients. So that was um, a good outcome. But while we were closing all these services, we were doing research. What are we going to do in dentistry? What are the recommendations? What are the best practices? So we looked at the American Dental Association, different entities um, that were giving recommendations. But as you, everybody knows, things were changing all the time. So it, we were having different balls in the air, if you will. Some of them were, okay, what are we gonna do? What are the plans? How do we treat the patients that are going to the clinic to mitigate risk? So we, we had to really pay attention to all those things at the same time. Our management group, everybody was involved during this time. So we were closed for four months. So four months that we couldn't really offer the regular services that we offer to our population. We see pediatrics, we have adults, geriatrics, and we were just limited to just the emergencies. So um, a few things were born out of this tragedy, if you will. Um, we were able to offer some preventive services for um, infants, just having um, a phone conversation with a video, trying to see these patients um, to offer preventive services in a way. Uh, so that, that lasted for a little bit, but uh, it, it's never the same as having the patients in person. And then we continue with the teledentistry as well. So after four months of being basically out of practice, um, we were given new recommendations that dentistry could reopen, but we couldn't reopen in the same way that we had before. So we had to learn how to use the protective equipment. We had to make changes in the operational area, engineering changes as well. So um, what ended up happening is that we created a phase approach to opening. So we had different phases to reopen first, we wanted to bring preventive services because we couldn't use any machine, any tool that would produce aerosols. We didn't have anything to protect the population and the employees. So we were waiting on getting the right equipment. As you can imagine, the challenge of choosing, what do we, what do we choose to make it safe for everybody? Also, how do we train everybody to make it safe? So, we started with um, with this phase facing approach. Uh, we slowly reopened the clinics. We have three clinics, and we were going one at a time. We have to call all. We had to call all the employees back, offering a new type of practice in a way. So you can imagine how challenges. I have never been like all, from all my life here at MCC so challenging. So this was the worst because I wanted to make sure that we opened the services but everybody was safe at the same time. So the phasing approach. So we started with the preventive and then adding more days to our clinics, adding more hours to be able to conserve the distancing that uh, the recommendations were given, training everybody on how to use the new equipment um, in terms of personal protective equipment. We had new masks, we had face shields, we had to do more disinfecting. As you can imagine, we are very careful in dentistry anyway. So we already had some good protocols, but these ones were added to the original ones. So we had to spend more time training and practicing. And it was a good time when we had the preventive services because we were not dealing with so many problems at the same time, aerosolized procedures, practicing. So we took one step at a time. And I think as a, as a side effect, the the employees felt safe. They felt that we were taking care of them. It wasn't about just opening and running a fast business. No, they felt like we were taking care of everybody. And the patients could see that as well. So we look for different solutions on how to start um, aerosolizing procedures. That's our bread, bread and butter and how we take care of the patients. We have to do fillings, we have to extract teeth and we have to use tools. So we found two different devices. Uh, one is, it looks like a vacuum that we can put in front of the patient's mouth and really suctions all the extra aerosols. And just to uh, tell everybody, we already have some protocols in place in which we have an assistant already suctioning 
all the saliva, all the aerosols. So that is already in place. We use rubber dam. It's a coat that you can really separate the mouth versus the outside. So that looks really, it's a good service. But then having that extra oral vacuum, that was an extra protective part that we could do. And on top of that, we found a UV light that kills germs and goes in the ceiling. So we were able to install those two machines in every single operator in our clinic. So you can imagine how much more protection we were providing in addition to what everybody has mentioned, the single point of entry, the screenings, uh, making sure that we don't have anything outside any items, pencils, papers that we that could cross contaminate from one to another. So when we received those machines that required again training, uh, how to use those machines, getting used to the protocols, and we did that again, all over again with the, the pending stuff. And on, in uh, September uh, the 14th, it was the 14th, we started the aerosolizing procedure. That was a big big, big success because dentistry, that's what we do. We take care of the patients and uh, they need to see us. So um, I can say that uh, everybody's getting more used to what we do right now. Um, if we feel safe. I'm not saying that this is a silver bullet because nobody and nobody's 100% protected, but I think MCC is doing the best to protect the community, to protect the employees. Um, of course, I have to say that we haven't been able to open as we did before. So we don't have the same number of staffing. Um, we used to have maybe five to six dentists per clinic. Now we have between three and four. Our uh, biggest challenge has been support staff. So even before COVID, we were not able to find a lot of dental assistants for the back office. They need special training and we were having difficulties. We, um, we had a lot of issues there, but then imagine when we had the COVID pandemic, that became really the worst challenge ever. And uh, some people were afraid to return in, that included staffing. So that, that has been an ongoing problem for us, but we were creative and we're trying to find ways of uh, solving that. We are trying to train on the job hiring hygienists, uh, doing a little bit of everything we can to support the staff. So that is still ongoing. Um, our plans will be to even expand the services that we already have, um, having more dentists for sure. At the time before COVID, we had another clinic that we're gonna open uh, on Second Street, but we had to put it on hold. But in the future, how it looks like, we would like to reopen that. We have a mobile dental van that we would like to go and take to schools that right now everything is on hold. Uh, but I think that dentistry, um, it, dentistry has been challenging. And I just have to say that dental services are essential for our health in general. So this is not, we don't have an option to say, okay, we're just not gonna do dentistry. We have to continue. We have seen a lot of more emergencies than before because people couldn't come to the dental clinic. And in pediatrics, you can imagine the little teeth, they really get decayed more rapidly than the adult teeth. So things can happen uh, really fast. So we've been doing a lot of extractions more than before, but that's what I have so far. Um, a work in progress. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Connie, for everything you're doing. And it's not been easy as you've outlined. And uh, there have been numerous studies that have shown the link between oral health and overall health. And I think we're just at the beginning of that understanding. That's just my opinion on that. But I think there's, uh, it's, the, the mouth is a part of the body, right? So <laughs> it's critically important. And, and it's sort of the, it's the beginning of what you put in your body as well. Um, so uh, it makes sense. And so thank you for all that you're doing. And as we continue to evolve and uh, innovate and adapt to the new world that we're living in, um, appreciate all that you and your team are doing. Uh, it's not been easy. Well, well, let's pivot to behavioral health. Uh, Dr. Karen Schmidt, uh, appreciate your thoughts on behavioral health care in, in, this, in this environment and how has it been going? <laughs> Um, thank you, Mitesh. We have been very busy here in the behavioral health department. Um, as my colleagues have been talking about, we've been doing a great job at MCC of fighting this viral pandemic. But as many of you are aware of, there's a concurrent mental health pandemic that is happening as a result of this virus. Um, and in fact, there's some recent studies that say 50% of Americans are saying that they feel an increase in distress and mental health symptoms. And 
one in three people actually meet diagnostic criteria for uh, anxiety or depression, which is a significant amount. And then as you guys know from the population that we serve at MCC, our people are particularly impacted by this. Um, there's the stress and the fear of the virus. There's the grief and loss of having multiple family members pass away from this virus. There's also the financial strain of job loss or job insecurity. Um, and I, as you know, work with children and there's also the very huge loss of being in school and with your friends and all the social developmental milestones you should be achieving right now. Um, so we're seeing it very much here at MCC. And as a result, the Behavioral Health Department is the busiest that we've ever been. Uh, and we now have an under 10% missed appointment rate. All of our people are coming and they're coming in droves. Um, but I'm really proud to say that our department has really risen to the challenge to meet the needs of our patients. We've hired three new full-time providers, including one who is uh, a lead triage provider, particularly to respond to crises and people that need help immediately. Uh, we also, like our colleagues, transitioned to, to a telehealth model in one day. Um, our entire department is remote and we continue to be remote to this day. And uh, we're seeing all of our patients either via phone or video. And as you can imagine, that has some challenges, but I'll talk more about later that it's actually been quite the, a blessing in disguise as well. Um, we also, uh, early in the pandemic, sent out a text message to every single one of MCC's patients acknowledging the stresses of this pandemic and offering that we have services available if they want. And we had 400 people respond. And I'm very proud to say we actually replied and talked to every single one of those people. Uh, so as you can see, there's a big need. And a lot of these people are people that normally would not have needed mental health services. And I think that's kind of a, a great equalizer of this pandemic is that um, lots of people are in stress right now. And uh, the fact that we're an integrated clinic and we have behavioral health right here and available makes it really easy to pop and have a couple of sessions with us and get back on to their normal functioning. Um, so that's been a real gift, I think, that we've been able to reach so many more people. Um, I want to talk about personally those uh, silver linings of the telehealth model. It, um, I work with kids and I will say there are some bumps in the road. I had a seven-year-old who wanted to show me his yoga moves that he used to calm himself down and he rolled right out of the screen. Um, and I had to say like, come back. Um, but I've also seen an amazing difference with my teenage patients. A lot of them prefer to talk on the phone. Um, and as all of us have been teenagers, we understand that. Uh, and What's happened is that there's been so many more disclosures. Uh, there's something about not actually having to look somebody in the eye that can sometimes make that easier. And, uh, you know, I've had multiple examples of people tell me, I haven't said this to anybody. Um, and a lot of them, I've never felt this way before, but being so isolated and stuck at home, I'm now having these feelings of, you know, suicidality, really severe things that they're going through on their own. Um, and us being able to call into their house and talk to them in that time of need has been essential. Um, and we've been able to see a lot of people um, in a lot of distress, but also be able to help them through it. You know, what's amazing about our population is how resilient they are. Um, and I'm obviously biased towards kids, but they're incredibly resilient. And all they need sometimes are a few tools or someone just to listen in that moment. Um, and it's been such a privilege to be able to go into their homes in this way and be able to connect with these kids and their families. You know, I've had um, a teenager that was one of these in this situation who before was the straight A student on the team at her local high school um, and was really impacted by COVID. Um, she had 
uh, multiple family members in the house that currently have it. Her father had lost his job because of the pandemic and she was not able to go outside or see anyone um, because of exposure and was really, really suffering. And she disclosed to me that she was feeling suicidal daily. And this is someone who said she had never felt that way before. And I was able to talk to her parents and we were able to come up with a plan and talk about how this stress of COVID is really affecting the whole family. And um, her parents were wonderful and they were under stress too. And just with a few tools, I, I just saw her on Monday for the last time because she's now graduated from treatment. She's back to her normal self. She's been doing homework with friends over Zoom. She practices her sports in her backyard. We've been able to make adaptations that are healthy within the pandemic, but also healthy for her development as a teenager. So that, I have to say, I feel like telehealth um, has a real value add. And I do think it's, it's changed our field and it, it is here to stay in some capacity. While I would love to get back in the clinic and see some of my patients in person, I do think that there, there's a real space for telehealth, especially with our patients where there's so many health inequities and they can't take time off from work to get to appointments. It's really wonderful to be able to get to see them. And as a working mom myself, I have to say, I really like being able to use telehealth too. So it's, um, there have been some silver linings, the main ones being the resilience of our patients uh, and our staff, as my colleagues have talked about. It's a pleasure to work at MCC and see everybody flip on a dime um, pretty much every other week and still show up with a smile on their face and ready to, to dig in and, and make a difference. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. Don't we have an amazing team at Marin Community Clinics? Um, I just want to, I'm going to give them a virtual applause here. I don't know. It's not quite as satisfying when you can't uh, get the reaction from everybody, but thank you all for all that you do. Um, I, I thought we were going to have time for questions, but our, our panelists have been so amazing. Um, if you've got questions, feel free to throw them in the chat, but we're going to try to keep, keep charging forward a bit in the interest of time. Um, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, um, the uh, incomparable Dr. Tom Peters. Dr. Peters, I don't think you can re officially retire until the pandemic is resolved, is solved <laughs> behind us. So you've got to hold on a little longer, I think. Uh, <laughs> but thank you for all that you've done for the community and for um, MCC over the years. And, and, you know, and thank you for your moral leadership. Um, it's, you know, I think it's, uh, it's been tremendous and, and wonderful to, to have your guidance over the years. And um, thank you for joining us this morning. Well, thank you, Matesh. Uh, what, a, what a warm and generous uh, invitation. On behalf of all of us at MCF, our, our board, our staff, and certainly on behalf of the many MCF donors who've been supporters of the Marin Community Clinics over the years, thanks so much for this invitation to join you this morning. You know, as I thought about being with all of you today, I realized I still carry a distinct and somewhat distant memory of uh, standing in the original version of Marin Community Clinic. Linda Tavasi will verify this. The oh so elegant double wide commercial trailers uh, stuck in the corner of Marin General's parking lot just off the entrance to the emergency room. Now I'm sure those trailers have gone on to greater glory, but um, I, I doubt you'll miss them too terribly. But from those rickety exam rooms in a parking lot in Greenbrae, to an evolved network of clinics serving all of Marin County. I'm so proud to have watched MCC grow, evolve and mature into the premier healthcare organization it is today. And yes, that advance is measured in a stunning set of numbers describing the gradient of growth in the number of patients, visits, staff, locations, et cetera. Harder to see, or to measure are the essential ingredients that have made that growth happen. Expertise, dedication, values, and vision. At the same time, you've brought another ingredient, less heralded, but just as critical, acumen, business acumen. 
A sense of community need and a commitment to the highest ethical and clinical standards is, of course, essential. But to manifest those standards, to bring them to life in a way that serves patients and families in need, requires a concurrent skill in management. And skill is what you have matched with vision. Skill matched with vision. Talking to donors and prospective donors whose hearts are drawn to the mission of MCC, but whose heads also want to be assured of managerial competence, my staff and I can give them our fullest endorsement. And Matesh, let me call you out on this. You, you, you are a wonderful combination of, of, these, of these skills and attributes. You, along with your executive team and, the, and with the notable support and encouragement of your board, have made this conversation with our donors simple and direct. MCC is an investment of philanthropic dollars that yields a truly remarkable ROI. Let me also take a moment, if I might, just to speak directly to the clinical and support staff of MCC. You guys have a long history of stepping up to significant challenges and poignant needs, never more so than this year. While much of the description of the raging pandemic of our time is presented in numbers, be it cases, tests, beds, vials, percentages, it's a boule base of numbers. But what really counts most of all is you guys, you and your colleagues, skill and expertise paired with sacrifice and determination, as we've heard this morning. That's what yields the life-saving care that too many throughout our community and throughout our country take for granted. You know, a year or so ago, well before the epidemic began, the World Health Organization declared that 2020 was to be the year of the nurse and midwife. Well, events of the day have shown that an even more proper and inclusive designation would be that 2020 is the year of nurses, midwives, doctors, psychologists, technicians, therapists, operational and support staff, all of you together. A tip of the hat to you. While I can't say what, uh, who will designate, I can express from all of us at MCF a deep sense of gratitude for your remarkable service. Finally, let me highlight two other characteristics of the Marin Community Clinics. It's that you speak of and plan for services based on the broadest definition of health. One of the reasons I so admire your work, Mitesh, and all of your staff is how often you speak not only of medical care, but of access to food, affordable housing, legal and environmental factors, education, and much more. You know and you respect the fact that individual patients and their families exist in a context, a social, economic, psychological, educational context that is imperative to calculate when planning to offer true and lasting care. And the other characteristic is how overtly you guys operate on your values. You honor diversity while at the same time you practice inclusion. Honor diversity, practice inclusion. And this of course is the combination that it takes for the clinics and indeed for our whole community to continue an inexorable move toward equity. And it's equity that forms the base for achieving a basic tenant of public health, that the health of any one of us is linked to the health of others, that the health of any individual or family is yoked to the health of the whole community, and that the reciprocal is just as true. So thank you to each and every one of the staff, board members and supporters of MCC. It's your dreams, your dreams of an equitable, healthy and sustainable community that you've dedicated yourselves to in years past, in the current time and into our future. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. On with the dreams. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. Um, it, um, I want to speak a bit about where we're going. I want to close with that. If that's running a little over time, so thank you for bearing with us. Um, let me share my screen here. If 
I can figure out how to do this. There we go. Okay. You might recognize Dr. Thompson on the stage. Okay, here we go. So we've just gone through a branding study, and I would I will say overall, Marin Community Clinics, we've been thinking about what is the next decade of healthcare broadly defined, as Dr. Peters so eloquently put it, um, look like, and how do, what is what, what is the need for uh, of our community, and how can we help to fill that need and to be of service. Um, we've grown tremendously over the years, and we're not quite the same organization that we were. We offer incredibly comprehensive services now, um, and we're, so we, we decided we need to take a step back and think about who, what is Marin Community Clinics, and what is the role of the clinics in the next decade? Uh, so we we looked at our our brand and how we present, if you will, to the community and to to patients um, and to all of you. And so what you see is a revised mission statement. Um, we think it captures the essence, and we think we can hopefully all remember it and put it into action. Our mission is to promote health and wellness through excellent, compassionate care for all. Um, we've chosen the words quite carefully, health and wellness. We think they're different things. And wellness tends to be more all-encompassing, right? Excellence, we think we're, we, we value high quality and we tend to con continue to be a very high quality performing uh, health center. Compassion is the heart of healthcare that I think you've heard about and the service and the way we do it and the way we provide it to our, our community and to our patients and the equity piece for all. Um, so essentially health equity is the, at the core of our mission. Our new tagline is, and you, you all are getting this pretty much first, our donors, and this we pre just presented this internally to our staff, the new, the new uh, branding. Um, our new tagline is touching lives through health. Um, I think you've heard a lot this morning that our staff, our clinicians are touched by our patients and we hope to do the reverse. We are in the human services business. We hope to help influence people, help them be healthier and to touch their lives. Um, so this is our new tagline going forward. And we've changed kind of our look our, our, our palette, if you will. We've changed our logo. Our logo is now uh, inspired by the sunflower, which, has, uh, which is considered to be a happy flower, which is, um, you know, hopefully elicits brightness and happiness. And also we think there's a circular component to it with maybe the patient in the middle, you might imagine with the community in the middle and Marin Community Clinics is here to serve the, the person and the community at large. Also portraying that yeah, it's, multi, it's multifaceted. It's not just one petal that makes a sunflower a sunflower. We hope this to be an inspiring um, call for, uh, for action as well and to help inspire us to uh, act in concordance with our values. And we've, we've also revamped our website to make it more friendly to patients and more easily to keep up to, more easy to keep up to date. You can certainly visit our new and approved website at uh, www.marineclinics.org. And the other aspect of thinking about what does the next decade look like? Um, before we get to the next decade, I think we have to think of the next 12 to 24 months, which is still battling COVID-19 and, and rolling out a vaccine to first our, our healthcare heroes, our staff, uh, and hopefully in short order, our plan is to deploy a vaccine within weeks as soon as it becomes available 
and then from there, as it as it more and more vaccine becomes available to deploy it to our to the community to our patients. Uh, but we are embarking on a capital campaign, and the thinking here is that there continues to be unmet need for our patients. So we structured it as as you see on the screen. Uh, we're looking at we're, we're hoping to do a six million dollar campaign. This is the first campaign MCC has conducted since 2008. So this is um, uh, a big a big move for MCC. We're looking to raise three million dollars for a new dental clinic that you heard Dr. Kadera allude to in Santa Fe's West End. We estimate that roughly half of our patients are served in our dental program. That means half of our patients are not. I will, I will add that MCC provides more dental care than any other health center out of the 14 health centers in our four county region, but that doesn't satisfy us. We wanna provide healthcare, dental healthcare to everyone who needs it. So this new dental clinic is critical to meeting that call. The second priority area is to expand care for adults and the growing aging population in Marin County. As you all know, one in three residents of Marin County are over 60. We used to have that infographic, one in three by 2020. Well, guess what? It's 2020. And one in three are over age 60. And MCC has always responded to the call of need of the community. Uh, years ago, when the TAM High School District reached out to Marin Community Clinics and asked if we could help provide on-site on services to students as part of their wellness center, we said yes. It was, a little, it was atypical, maybe, or a little different, a little different unmet need, but we responded because there was a need. Similarly, the aging population in Marin County has fewer and fewer options to receive healthcare services. And we see that trend only continuing as uh, healthcare has moved increasingly corporate and private practices have consolidated or left and not been replaced. We see that Marin Community Clinics has a vital role to fill that need in the years to come. So as such, we're raising $2 million to expand for a new clinic in Green Bay. And finally, we have uh, we're looking we have buildings and then we have people as you've heard from our people i think you will you'll agree that they're critical to delivering care to our patients and to our community we are looking to seed a healthcare provider recruiting and retention fund um, of 1 million dollars in order to the goal there would not be to touch the corpus of the fund but to simply take the the dividend interest of that fund on an annual basis and apply it to serve uh, this, this important need. I'm very excited to inform everyone that we have a pre-commitment uh, from Dennis and Susan Gilardi in the amount of $2 million um, toward the Green Break Clinic. So I really wanna thank them for that amazing commitment. Um, and so, you know, we, if this is something that is of interest to you and you want to, uh, talk with us more about it, please feel free to reach out and you will be hearing more about this as we officially launch the campaign, um, very soon. And just, um, you know, we ending on this slide, we appreciate all that you do and your, the amazing impact that you make um, by um, what you, you do as donors. You, you've heard from our clinicians, from our staff of the impact of the direct patient care and their, the impact on our community that we have every day. But I, I wanna emphasize the impact you as donors make on helping us achieve those results. Um, you can give in ways that you may not have thought about 
Um, there's, of course, the annual gifts that are at the bottom there with the sunflower you see. But there's also our legacy circle, which, which is a way for you to give um, in perpetuity, if you will, um, as part of a planned gift, a state gift, that sort of thing. And also in a year where the stock market has gone up, it's a way for people to to give either through an IRA or you know their mutual funds or whatnot to give without having tax implication. I consult your tax folks on that. Don't don't talk to me. I'm not your tax person. But it's just another way for you to support Marin Community Clinics. So I just wanted to call these out. And again, thank you all for your tremendous impact. Um, support and contribution over these years. And we really appreciate everything you do. So um, we're about 10 minutes over time. And I think if anyone has any last questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, we can end this presentation and this, end this call. Does anyone have any questions? We still have the panelists. No. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for all that you do, and thanks for you know whether you're a, a staff member, whether you're a donor, whether you're a supporter, whether you're you're all friends of Marin Community Clinics, and we're only accomplishing what we accomplish to support our community at, together. So thank you for everything that you do, and hope you all are well and stay safe. Thank you.